worship you, Jesus, this morning. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. online service from East Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Praise the name of the Lord. My name is James Kafugi, and I am delighted, proud, and privileged to be your minister this morning. And um, whatever you are and wherever you are doing, help me welcome the worship team as the leaders into worship and praise. Thank you so much. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. Stop. 
stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Oh, thank you for moving in our midst, so oh God. Even in our homes, you're moving, Lord. In our nation, you're moving, Jesus. Thank you for moving and bringing your healing power, Lord. We worship you over every song, oh God. We worship you above this circumstance that we are going through. We lift up the name of Jesus. We lift up the banner of Christ even in our nation. We lift up the banner of Christ in our homes. We lift up the banner of Christ, oh God, in our families, Jehovah, that you're fighting for us, oh God. How majestic is your name, oh God, in all the earth. We choose to exalt the name of Jesus this morning, oh God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God that was slain for the sin of the world this morning. We give you praise, O oh God. How majestic is your name, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, join us this morning as we continue to declare that his name is majestic in all the earth. How majestic is your name, O oh God. In all the earth we exalt you. We give you praise and we give you glory, oh God. How majestic is your name, oh Lord, in all the earth. Your name is strong and mighty. Your name is glorious and great, in Him we are saved. The name of Jesus, higher than other names, King of all kings, no other name like Him. Oh, the name of Jesus. i
us, Lord, we call upon your name this morning because your name is greater than any name. The name of Jesus is higher than any situation. It's higher than Corona, higher than cancer, higher Jehovah God than any mountain that we may face in our lives, oh God. And that's why this morning all we need is you. It's nothing about us, oh God. It's all about you. All this is for you, oh God. Father, we want more of you, even in this season that you're drawing us deeper and deeper in love with you, Jesus. Thank you, Master, oh God. Join us even as we sing this morning, this song that says, Nachotaka Niwewe. There's nothing else we need in our lives except the presence of God in our lives. Nachotaka Niwewe tu Nachotaka Niwe Niwewe tu Hajaya moyo wangu Yesu Hajaya moyo wangu Yesu Nachotaka Niwe
Nilichotaka ni wewe tu ni wewe tu Hata ya moyo wangu Yesu Hata ya moyo wangu of your power, more of your presence, Lord, in our lives. We need more of your spirit, oh God, because you are with us this morning. We will not be afraid, Jehovah God. We magnify you, Jesus. We worship you, King of glory. Lord, we desire to know you more than the thoughts in our minds, oh God. Tunataka tukujue zaidi ya fahamu zetu mfalme wa amani. Zaidi ya mahitaji yetu, tunataka tukutumikie kwa ngugu mpya mfalme wa amani. Asante Mungu kwa nguvu zako. Asante kwa kutuloesha kwa uwepo wako asubuhi ya leo Mungu mfalme mkuu. Tunalinua jina lako. Tunasema ni asante Mungu wetu. Unastahili shifa, unastahili heshima. Unastahili kuinuliwa mfalme mkuu. Nachotaka ni we, ni wewe tu. Nachotaka ni we, ni we. So thank you so much to the worship team. And in such uh, uncertain moments, what I usually like to do when met with um, inexplicable situations, I like to resort into prayer. But more often than that, um, I'd love to offer encouragement to all and sundry, given that we are in a pandemic that has gripped the world. If you are fixated on the news, you're definitely worried about the trajectory that our, our country or you know the whole world is going. Uh, experts, um, scientists, have laid a burden and have definitely said that as a continent, we are likely to be the hardest hit given our failing healthcare system. So I'd love for you to join me in prayer, in praying for the frontline health workers, for the young men, the women who have given their lives, dedicated themselves into combating this virus. I'd love to also pray for the scientists within our country, for the people, the essential workers, and also for wisdom within the government. And in all honesty, let us pray for discipline within our government coffers, because we are all aware that whenever money is allocated to fight or deal with an issue in our country, corruption always looms. So let's remember to condemn the ones who might think of stealing money from this issue that has equalized everyone. I would love to also convey our deepest condolences to the ones that have lost their dear loved ones. As you know, our church is located in Buruburu. Long before the virus had come, to our country on April 13th, on a Friday. You know, uh, you know, there were conspiracy theories that it wouldn't affect us as Africans, particularly black Africans, as it did other races. But we've been proven wrong. As the government has said, the virus is here and it's now locally transmitted. Of course, many of us are concerned about our loved ones, especially if you have loved ones who have pre-existing conditions of people who are elderly or infants. So we may pray against that. We may pray for sanity. We may pray for our, you know, people's children, for the candidates who are about to sit for the exams this year. We pray for people who've lost their jobs, people who are living from paycheck to paycheck people who are being ravaged by the floods. We pray against, I insist, the corruption that might be looming. We remind them that there'll come a day that they'll be answerable to the Most High. 
This is a disease that has affected the royalty, the leading political leaders globally. It is one that can affect anyone and everyone. It is one that is definitely causing depression. And we'd love to remind everyone that there is a name above every other name. It is Jehovah Rapha. Right now, we do pray and we do definitely hope for the best. There's a saying that we should hold firmly without wavering to the faith that we confess. May that be our encouragement this morning. Even as we battle, even as we hope, and even as we wish for greatness and a vaccine and for normalcy to return. So without much further ado, let me invite Reverend Elvis Irungu. So kindly help me snap your fingers for Reverend Elvis Irungu. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. We thank the Lord for giving us this day so that we can worship together, hear the word of the Lord. And I had promised last week that we're going to continue with the series that uh, I had started. I spoke about self-centeredness as a big problem in our families. And I had said I will give an antidote to self-centeredness. And this antidote is called selfless service. So today I'm going to be talking about that because what most people are looking for in families is romance. And romance is good, but it's just one of the pillars. But those pillars, or like that pillar, has to be based on the bedrock of self-service in any family. In any happy family, there must be selfless service. Now, selfless service is not a cool term. We don't hear about it from Hollywood. We don't hear about it from our cultures. Even many people don't talk about it. So selfless service is not a cool thing. It's not an aspiration of many people. Many young men are not aspiring to get married to young ladies so that they can serve them. And many young ladies are not aspiring to get married to young men so that they can serve them. Selfless service is patient. Selfless service is gentle. Selfless service is kind. And selfless service is gracious. So God made men and women so that they can serve each other. And as I talk today, I know that there are difficult cases in families. And maybe I'm not going to be addressing that here, but I want to say that one difficulty is where one is married to a partner or a spouse who is forever cheating. Now, that is a very difficult case. But if you're living with such a spouse, then you need to know one thing, that you are married maybe to a community wife or a community husband, and that is dangerous. So you need to think about what to do with that if you're married to such a person. Another very difficult situation is where you are being battered by your spouse. So if your spouse batters you, that's a hard case. You never know when he's going to kill you. It's like living with death in your clothes. And so those are two exceptionals that I don't think I'm going to be handling in this sermon today. But for the other things that make us fight here and there, I think they can be well handled within my sermon today. And I'm going to read from the Bible. We're going to get our text from the book of John, chapter number 13. We're going to see a beautiful story there. John, chapter number 13, I read from verse number 1. Now, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things, 
into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. May the Lord bless his word. Jesus came from glory. He didn't come as a master, but he came as a servant. He said, I am not coming to be served, but I'm coming to serve. He came to bind the hearts that were broken. He came to open the eyes of the blind. He came to unstop the ears of them who are deaf. He came to heal the sick. He came to feed the hungry. And he came to die for us and to take away our sins. And the Bible says that a greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus came to serve us to the uttermost. He came to serve us with his body. He came to lay down his body for us. He came to die for us so that he could serve us. And after serving, Jesus calls upon his followers to serve one another. Love is proved through deeds, not talk, because talk is cheap, very cheap. So on this eventful day, Jesus comes and they're having supper with his disciples. And after supper, Jesus removes his outer garment. After removing his outer garment, he starts to wash the disciples' feet. He had a towel wrapped around his waist, and he washed one disciple after another. One disciple after another. And then it came to Peter's time to be washed. And he asked, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus said, yes. And Peter said, no. Lord, you cannot wash my feet. And Jesus asked, why? Peter, I have to wash your feet. You do not understand what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. And Peter says, no, you know, he's arguing like you see, masters do not wash the feet of their servants. It's the other way around. It's the servants who wash the feet of the master. So Lord, I do not want you to wash my feet. But Jesus stands his ground and says, Peter, listen to me. If I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. And Peter gets a message. And he allows him to wash his feet. And Jesus dries his feet. And you see, Jesus came over here to serve. He removed his outer garment so that he could wash the feet of his disciples. And after that, he told us to do the same. He said, I have set an example for you. I want you to serve one another. You see, 
Many times we come into our homes with our garments, garments of who we are. I am a CEO, I am a great politician, I am a great doctor, I am a great lawyer, a great engineer, a great journalist. And when I come home, I come with those garments. I may not be able to serve because of what I think I am. When I come with that air to my house, I may not be able to serve. But if I come home and I want to serve, then at my door I'll remove that garment so that I can simply become honey or sweetheart or papa or mama. And that is what Jesus is encouraging us to do. That when we come home, we should remove those garments and just become papa, mama, honey, sweetheart at home. You see, our cultures have taught us many things. Like in the culture that Jesus was in, a servant is the one who was supposed to wash the feet of the master and not the other way around. But Jesus transcended that culture. Jesus overstepped. He went beyond that culture and began to serve. Another time when Jesus transcended the culture was when he went to Samaria and spoke to the Samaritan woman. At that time, Jesus went beyond culture because the Samaritans and the Jews don't talk. They were not talking at that time. And so Jesus went beyond culture and spoke to people that he was not supposed to speak to. At another time was his, when his disciples were passing through the field, they picked some wheat and they began to eat. And some people were concerned that the disciples of Jesus were eating grains without washing their hands. But Jesus was not bothered by that. And Jesus said, it is not what a person eats that defiles him, it's what comes out of his heart. Jesus would keep overstepping the culture so that he could serve. And what do I mean by this? I am not saying we should do away with our cultures. I'm not saying that men should become women and that women should now take the roles of men in families. No, that is not what I'm saying. We should keep our cultures the way they are. But when necessary, we should be able to sidestep or overstep or transcend or go beyond the culture so that we can bring happiness to our families. Our cultures have taught us that men cannot mop floors. Our cultures have taught us that men do not cook. Our cultures have taught us that men do not wash clothes. They have taught us that men do not fold clothes. They have taught us even in some places that men do not spread beds. And on the other hand, our cultures have also taught us that women do not pay rent. In other places, cultures have taught us that women do not pay school fees. It's a man's role. And that women do not give money to buy food. That is a man's role. And also that women do not give money to buy clothes for the family. That is a man's role. That is what cultures have taught us. In fact, some women say that your money is our money. That is, the husband's money is our money, but my money is mine alone. That's what women say in some cultures. And so, in order to bring happiness in our homes, we need to transcend such cultures. We need to go beyond that so that we can serve. You see, someone by the name Robert Dale tells us this, that servant leaders lead out of relationships. So in other words, what he's saying is that if you want people to follow you, you need, you need to have a relationship with people. You do not have to try to dominate people. He also says that servant leaders lead from the love that they have for people and not domination. And so if we borrow his words, when men come to their homes, they should lead from the love that they have for their wives and not trying to dominate their wives. And vice versa, even women when they come home, they should not try to dominate their husbands. They should live and relate to one another out of love. Another man by the name Gary Chapman, he teaches us 
five languages of love and he has written this in his book, The Five Languages of Love. So Gary Chapman tells us about these five languages of love. And he says, if you want to serve your spouse very well, you need to understand these five languages of love. And he talks about these languages. He says, one of the, language, one of the languages is the language of service. There are some people who feel very loved when people talk the language of service to them. In other words, when they are served by the people who love them, either their wife or their husbands, they feel a lot of love. That is one of the languages that he talks about. He also talks about another language. That is words of affirmation. Some people feel most loved when they are affirmed. Another kind of a language that he talks about is the giving of gifts. Some people feel very loved when they are given gifts. Another kind of a language that he talks about is spending quality time. Some people feel very good when their spouses spend time with them. That is when they feel most loved. And he encourages us to speak that kind of a language if that is what appeals most to our spouses. And lastly, he speaks about another language and that is the physical touch. There are people who feel most loved when they are touched or hugged. And so this man encourages us to go study our spouses. If we want to give them selfless service, if we want to give them very good service, we need to understand their language of love. Because if we speak to them in a language that does not communicate love to them, then we will not be communicating love and they will not be impressed. So if we want to impress them, we have to speak in a language of love, a language that they understand. For instance, if one person's language of love is physical touch, if that is your language of love, and you think if you touch your spouse, that is when you're going to be communicating love, and maybe your spouse's love language is maybe an act of service, even if you touch them, you're communicating nothing. You're not communicating love. So if you want to communicate to such kind of a spouse, what you need to do is speak the language of service. Go fix breakfast and give them. Maybe eye on their blouse or their shirt and give it to them. That is when they're going to feel loved. So if you want to express selfless service to your spouse, you need to understand your spouse. In terms of rating one to five, I know that what is my number one is what is number five for my wife. So if I try to speak in a language that I understand most as a language of love, the one that makes me feel most loved, if I communicate to my wife in that language, she feels nothing. And so if I want to express good service to her, I have to speak in her language of love. And that is what all of us are encouraged to do. When we speak in the language of love that our spouses understand, if we give the services that they love most, then they feel valued. If we speak in the language they understand most, if we serve them that way, then of course we deposit in their emotional banks. And that way there is happiness at home. All of us get happy. There is something else that we read or learn from this story. When Peter was refusing Jesus to wash his feet, he did not have full understanding. Peter was following his culture that a master should not wash the servant's feet. That is what his culture taught him. And Peter did not understand what Jesus was doing. What Jesus was doing was symbolic. And Jesus was trying to say that, look, in a few days, I'm going to be dying. And I will die for you. When I die for you, I will wash your sins with my blood. I will have taken care of your essential sin. You will have been accepted into the family of God. And once you are accepted, you don't have to get born again every day. But... When you walk in the streets, you get dirty. 
And when you get dirty, you need to wash your feet. So this is what Jesus was telling them. Yes, Peter, you're going to be born again. Yes, Peter, you are clean now. I've cleaned you with the word. And I'm going to wash you with the blood. And you're going to be right into the kingdom of God. But even when you are saved, I know there are days when you will wake up and you will sin without intending to sin. When you do that, I will forgive you and I will cleanse you. I am giving you an opportunity, Peter. I want to wash your feet daily. I want to cleanse your sins daily, Peter. I am extending grace to you. And so what Jesus was communicating was this. I know you guys are broken. I know that even if I've cleaned you, that you will still have some sin in you. But I'm extending grace to you. I will be cleaning your sins every day. And that is why I'm giving you an opportunity to pray every day. Our Father who art in heaven, forgive our sins. Forgive us the way we forgive those who have sinned against us. Jesus was trying to communicate grace. How come that when we go to our spouses, we expect them to be perfect? Jesus does not expect that we're going to attain perfection today, but he's going to grow us towards perfection. But yet, when it comes to our spouses, we want them to be perfect. We want them to operate as angels. They cannot operate as angels because they're still suffering from the effects of the fall. They are broken by sin. They still have twisted brains. And that will be corrected when Jesus comes back for us. So what am I trying to say? When we speak to our spouses, we need to give them room to be human beings. We cannot demand perfection from our spouses and yet we ourselves are not perfect. If we want to have happy homes, we have to let our spouses be human. We should expect that they're not going to be perfect. They will fail once in a while. And that is no more for human beings. So we should quit demanding that they be perfect. Something else that we should not do is that we should not criticize them every time keep blaming them every time. What we need to give them is unconditional love and acceptance, even if they're not very perfect. And of course I said, when it comes to people who are perennial cheaters, you need to know what to do with that. Make a decision, you yourself. If you're married to a community husband or a community wife, Make a decision what you will do with that relationship. And if you are living with a spouse who is threatening to kill you, make a decision what to do with that spouse. Something else is that when we want to give our spouses selfless love is that we should serve them with gladness of heart and with joy. You know, many times when we come home and we are very tired, and we are asked to do something, we can do it with grumbling hearts. We can do it with a lot of complaints in our hearts. But if we want to maintain happy homes, if we want to have joy, if we want our spouses to be happy, if we want to stop fighting, then when we serve, we have to do it with a lot of joy in our hearts. You see, if you come home and you find that your spouse has a lot of work and they request you to, to do something, like they request you to brush the shoes of the kids or to iron clothes or do something and help, and you grumble, they see it. And when they see you grumbling, they're not very happy. But you see, what we forget is that there are other people out there they meet, very attractive people, very good looking people, and those people would be willing to do what your spouses request anytime. And what does that tell you? If we do not serve with gladness of heart, then our spouses can go out there and they will get many people out there who will be willing to do what we don't want to do. And then what will we be doing to our families? we would be putting our families in very, very precarious situations. So when we serve, we should do it with gladness of heart. If your spouse comes from a journey and she says, 
Oh, honey, please, massage my feet. They are hurting. Don't grumble. Don't grumble. Just do it. After all, you promised before God and man that you're going to be there in good times and in bad times. If your husband needs you to do something for him, don't grumble. Just do it for him. And something else that we should do if we want to be good at home and if we want to serve in a nice way is that we should quit the desire or the need to be right at every time. Because you see, couples are fighting because of so many things. Peter would have fought with Jesus Christ about who is right, about washing the feet. They could have argued. But you see, that is not very good in a home. If you want to make your spouse very happy, you should quit that need. The need to be right every time. Because people are fighting over very, very simple things in their homes. People fight over toilet paper. Should it run like this? Or should it roll like this? People argue. People argue about how to fold clothes. Should they be folded like this? Or like this? People argue. People argue about which side of the bed should I sleep? People argue. People argue about which is the shortest route to place A or place B. They argue. They argue a lot. People argue about who is going to control the music or the radio in the car. Which station are we going to listen to? People argue. And so, if you want to insist on being right, then you're not going to be displaying the humility that is needed to make your spouse happy. Lastly, I want to say this. When you're serving your spouse, please make sure you spare some energy. When we leave our homes in the morning, we go spend all the energy serving our bosses, serving our colleagues, serving customers. We upbeat. In the evening, we want to go take coffee with our friends in the restaurants. We have energy. But by the time we're reaching home, we have no energy. When you reach there and your spouse says, please, can you change the baby? You say, I have no energy. I am very tired. Your spouse asks you to do something else. You're tired. You have no energy. You cannot afford to serve all the people in the world and you have no energy for your family. We have to spare energy for our families. We have to work, work very hard, but no, that we have to spare some energy so that when we're going to our homes in the evening, we have some energy to serve. Just in case we're going to find that our spouses are very busy, you may find your husband still working and he's buried in work, he still has work and he still has things to do, you need to have some energy so that if he asks you to help him, you will have energy to help. So we must spare some energy to serve our families. So I'm talking about selfless service for our families. How can we do that? Here are some few examples. For instance, a man can come and tell his wife, Today I want you to take an off. I will take care of the dinner. I will take care of the dishes. And I will take care of the babies. Go watch a movie. Go have a rest. Or you can come home and you find your wife working and say that you're also going to mop the floor and that you're going to clean the toilet. Or you can come home and ask, what can I do to make your evening easier? What can I do? What can I do for you? Such things are going to give us happiness at home. Some of us should, tra should train ourselves how to cut a man's hair. Some of us should give breakfast in bed. Some of us should ask our spouses what they need. I like it when my wife asks me, what do you want to have for supper? Make your wish. And I make my wish. 
And by the time I reach home, I find that, that meal ready. I feel love in the air. I feel good. I feel loved. And so, this is what I'm trying to encourage us to do. Now we should serve our spouses. We should scan around, we should come home, scan around and see what needs to be done. If we find that our husbands have a lot of work, see how we can help them. If we find that our wives have a lot of work, we help them. Somebody by the name Nancy Cobb and Connie Grisby, these people wrote a book, The Politically Incorrect Wife. And this book is based on Matthew 25 verse 35 to 40, where Jesus encourages us to serve the sick and to serve the people who are homeless by inviting them into our homes and when he encourages us to feed the hungry and to visit the prisoners. And you see this, what they say. They say, if you find your husband hungry and you give him food, they say that you are serving a hungry person. They also say, if you see your husband walking in the compound and take him a drink, you are giving a drink to a thirsty person. They also say, if you find him messing or he has made some mistakes and you accept him unconditionally, then it's like you have welcomed a stranger into our homes. And they say that when you know all the weaknesses of your husband and his vulnerabilities and you do not expose him to children and to the family, then it's like you are clothing a naked person. And of course, if he has a lot of deadlines for work and you go and help him, then it's like you are visiting a prisoner. And what do they say about a wife? Is that when a man comes home, and he finds the wife, and he takes time to talk to her. He sits and just talks to her, heart to heart. It's like this person is feeding a hungry person. And also, when somebody's wife behaves badly, and this person does not retaliate, it's like inviting a stranger into your home. They also say that when your wife is emotionally low because of the realities of life. If you get to her and hug her and make her feel secure, it's like you are clothing a naked person. And lastly, they say, if you find that your wife is having mood swings and she's having hormonal changes in her body and you're patient with her, it's like you are taking care of a sick person and you are taking care of Jesus. That is what we are encouraged to do for one another. That is what we are encouraged to do to serve one another in our families. If we serve one another in our families, love will always be in the air. If we serve one another, we do not have to worry about romance. Romance will take care of itself as your love dying. Seek to serve your spouse. When you serve your spouse, there will be happiness in that home. That problem of lack of love will be solved maybe forever in your house. God bless you. See you next time. Just before I go, I want to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for our families, O oh God. I want to pray, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that we will begin to do what you have commanded us to do. You have commanded us to serve one another, oh God. You have given us the command and the place where we need to start this service, oh God, is in our homes. We need to lay down our lives for our spouses. And I pray, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that you will help us to lay down our lives, oh God, for our wives and our husbands. I pray, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that God, that you will take away the self-centeredness that we have been carrying around. And I pray, O oh God, that that will be replaced with selfless love. Yes, God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that all of us will learn to serve one another in our families. 
This I pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Elvis. And, uh, and in the spirit of selfless service, uh, we do have the pay bill number 904801, where you can send your tithes and your offerings. And also, uh, also in the same spirit of selfless service, we can also send any cash donation to people. Uh, we do have our food bank. Send your food bank donation to 904801. I repeat, 904801. So that comes to a close this uh, wonderful Sunday. So kindly let me invite Pastor Elvis back to the pulpit as he gives us the benediction of the day. Thank you. We're going to read our benediction from the book of Numbers, chapter number six. And I will read the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you and may he keep your families. After all, your name is the great.